Welcome to our broadcast. The Hollywood studio system collapsed after World War II. It made way for a new breed of independent filmmakers. They included, and think about this list, Marty Scorsese, Brian De Palma, Steve Spielberg, George Lucas, and especially Francis Ford Coppola. With the Godfather trilogy and Apocalypse Now, Coppola developed his epic yet very personal style within the major studios. Then he started his own company, Zoetrope, and even bought his own movie studio in the early 1980s. The creative outlet he sought would eventually bankrupt him. Having lost nearly everything, he has recovered in the 1990s. He continues to make movies, and he continues to make wine from his beautiful home in the Napa Valley. And I'm very pleased to have him here today to talk about many things, about living, about film, and yes, about wine. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. How come you became a winemaker? Is it part of being of your own heritage? I mean, your father's a musician, mm -hmm. not a winemaker. And does, does living in the Napa Valley and everybody's around you, do you say, I want to do that too? Well, the Italian family, you know, drank wine with the table long before uh, the average American family considered that. And uh, I'd always heard stories about the wine my grandfather made in uh, upper Italian Harlem in the yeah. basement. And it was always, uh, the, these stories were always told. And it upper was a, Italian Harlem in the basement. <laughs> upper, yeah, upper uh, Lexington Avenue, 110th right, Street right. in what was known as Italian Harlem. Right. And they would have cement. Uh, concrete fermenters in the basement, and every year they would buy a boxcar of grapes from California. So anyway, there was this myth or this this romance in my family, so that when uh, we we of course all live in San Francisco, and uh, Napa Valley is very close, and I had the idea it would be nice to have a little cottage, you know, like a summer house with yeah. an acre of grapes. And when we were looking for such a house, the realtor said, "Oh, this isn't for you, but the Inglenook Estate is going to be sold, and it's a chance just to see it." And he, he showed it to us, and it really wasn't the type of thing we were thinking of, but it was so beautiful. It was like a national park that eventually we did come into possession of it, and with it, 120 acres of the, you know, among the finest Cabernet in America. And uh, little by little, having this fruit and having everyone wanted to buy it from us, we began to actually uh, make the wine, and that was over 15 years ago. And did you bring in a lot of smart people to help you? make it? I mean, you go, are, were they there as part of the Well, the farm? Napa Valley does have a community, and there was a great winemaker, famous winemaker named Andrei Chalachev, who was a man in his 90s and was, uh, I think, the winemaker at BV. And we did, uh, we did uh, go to him, and, and he took over the winemaking. And uh, yes, we were always in the hands of uh, experts and, and Napa Valley people. Now, is this what you drink in, in your better moments? When Are, are you slipping away to get someone else's who's been at this longer than you have. Well, you know, I do, have, I do find that my tastes really now run to Napa Valley wine, and, and uh, I mean, I, I always have enjoyed wine, and, uh, but there is something unique about the Napa Valley wines. I like to drink our own wines, and uh, we also make some family wines that are, you know, less aged, and uh, this is sort of for a great meal. Yeah, 1980 here. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, I do like the Napa Valley wines. I like Australian wines as well. How about uh, French wines? Uh, well, you know, those are, the, those are the, the, the model that we strive for, but more and more I am starting to drink a French wine and a, and a, and a, and a Napa Valley wine and realize that I'm now either used to it or I prefer its, uh, its character. Let me go back way back to the beginning for you. Uh, there was early on this sort of fascination. That, um, well, you tell me about it. I mean, your father was a musician. You started in Detroit. Uh, he was uh, with the Detroit Symphony. No, he was with the Ford Hour, which was oh, a radio program that would go on in, in the late 30, in the 30s, and it was sort of Henry Ford's pet right. uh, project or one of his pets, and he would actually be there. And of course, I was born there, but I left as an infant. But my name is Francis Ford because the my Ford father Hour. named him after Henry Ford, and I was also born in the Henry Ford Hospital. And then he came to, you began to live in Queens when he came to join Tchaikovsky's? No, it an was, NBC uh, symphony? It was uh, Toscanini. Toscanini, my, I'm sorry. My dad was the solo flute yeah. for the NBC okay. symphony in the, really during the war years and uh, up into the 1945 or 46. Yeah. When did you, what were you like then? What was it like growing up in your household? And when did all of this sort of sense of, of, of feeding this now legendary Coppola imagination began. Well, it, it was, a, I think, very magical uh, childhood. In fact, for years I thought my father, when I was little, was a magician. And it was only when I was a little older that I realized he was a musician. Yeah. 
but I very much remember the sound of the flute uh, as a little kid because being a symphony uh, musician, he practiced, uh, you know, and prepared and warmed up, and I always used to hear this kind of uh, beautiful sound. And to this day, when I hear a, a flute, I just, it just brings back my father to me. I lost him uh, right. a couple of years ago. And I had an older brother who was extremely uh, important to me, five years o older, and always leading me into exciting new areas, literature when I was yeah. young. And, uh, and it, was just a, it was just a very magical family, I think. And we had the Italian-American influence. My dad always, uh, although you know, my grandparents and my parents l really loved America as the Italian-America does, they always made me feel as though our Italian culture was something uh, to be proud of. And we ate pizza when no one ate pizza, and we had wine at the table. Yeah. They used to call you science. Yes. <laughs> Why was that? Well, I was a boy scientist. I loved, more than anything, uh, technology and uh, uh, learning about the lives of the scientists. And I, I always had in my life, I do now, a little shop where I would build things and try to make inventions. And, and uh, ultimately, was always, I was uh, always involved in the radio club or the science club, or I, I could make little bombs that would blow up a remote uh, yeah. when I was little and, and I just loved science and puppets and I think ultimately um, and it's because puppets are sort of scientific a little bit you know you have a string and the mouth yeah. opens and that ultimately led me to participate uh, in the lighting of the of the school plays yeah. and the love of movies uh, I always loved movies my brother used to take me my 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 first impression of films were the Korda films uh, the Thief of Baghdad, right. The Man Who Could Work Miracles. Uh, to this day, I, I adore the, the work of Alexander Korda and yeah. that unique style that they had. But, um, you know, we went to the movies. I always went with my brother. And, uh, but, it, but I first became involved in theater before really thinking that I might be a film director. Uh, I was I, I from going from being the person uh, who did the lights and worked on the tech crews of uh, the high school shows or what have you. Ultimately, I became in my college career, uh, you know, kind of interested in directing mainly because I was always up on a ladder hanging a light and watching the the professor direct the actors. And after a while, I got the confidence that I could do it, and I started to do that. Other than, than Alexander Korda, who influenced you? I mean, who was shaping the way you thought about film and the way you thought about what you wanted to do with your life? Well, first, I have to say that it was uh, uh, the theater and the work of Tennessee Williams and Ilya Kazan uh, being a drama student of the 50s. Uh, these were the magical names, of course, Marlon Brando. Uh, I, I really uh, loved and responded as a many people to Tennessee Williams plays and uh, read them very young and in fact I did a production of uh, Streetcar Named Desire when I was 17 in college. I became a little bit of the the boy wonder of Hofstra College. I, <laughs> yes, I, I in fact started the yeah. drama club that's yeah. still there, the one that I did and I even tried to start a, a Hofstra cinema workshop uh, which in those days funny how it is now but uh, I think two students yeah. came but I had a very... Did uh, you merge something, though? I mean, was it something you created, something called the Spectrum, or you merged The Spectrum, it? yeah. What it was is that there were two big organizations. That one was the drama organization, one was the musical comedy organization, which I, I was... Uh, and I discovered that the funding for the plays was really coming from the, uh, the student activities fee. And what I did, basically, was become president of both of them at the same time and merge them together and issue a, a decree that <laughs> only students could direct the major yeah. productions, of course, and that's how I got my chance. Was being at Hofstra shaping influence? Totally. Hofstra was a wonderful place. I had wonderful uh, uh, teachers, uh, some of whom are gone, uh, Professor Beckerman, who later went to Columbia. And, you know, this was precedental to let uh, s young students take over actual, normally in a school, the faculty directs the shows, the big yeah. shows. And, yeah. and after I had a beautiful theater, it still does. And, uh, you know, partly my own political maneuvering, but also I think under a proud eye of the faculty, we took on some enormous production as kids and, and musicals, uh, original musicals. And it was, I think, the encouragement of, of you know, a, an artist needs, a young artist needs to know that they can even do it in order to aspire to do things, and I got that at Hofstra. Well, I read a story about you uh, going to the movie and seeing Sergei Eisenstein's 
yeah. Ten Days That Shook the World based on the John Reed book, right. and that somehow you it changed your outlook. Well, I wanted to go to the Yale Drama School, and I, I really wanted to be a playwright uh, in those days, and it was, uh, you know, r r it takes years to make a writer, and certainly my efforts as a playwright, although I had a, dr a playwriting scholarship at Hofstra, I just was, uh, um, you know, I just didn't feel uh, that I had any talent, and talent was a big commodity in my, f in my family. I mean, my father was, uh, you know, very uh, tough on whether you had the gift of talent or not. At any rate, I didn't feel I had any writing talent, although I would write every day and try, and so I sort of became a director in school uh, almost by default because I seemed to have ability to get the show on and to get the sets built. But one afternoon around 4 o'clock on, on a fall day, the little theater, I uh, saw a poster that said they were going to show this Eisenstein film. I had never heard really of Eisenstein. And I saw 10 Days That Shook the World with three other people in this room. And I was so uh, uh, impressed. I'd never seen, because it's a silent film, I'd never seen film that worked like that. And it was on that day that I said I wanted to... Uh, to, to be a film director and not a, a theater person. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because Eisenstein himself, who was a, a theater uh, designer uh, in his, in his uh, autobiography, refers to the fact uh, that on a certain day, equally, he said the cart broke and the, the driver fell into cinema. Yeah. So he had a kind of... And for a while, Eisenstein became a little bit of a guiding influence because I, I felt it was very good that I get a good theater basis in theater craft and acting uh, and then go on to, to movies. And uh, to this day, for young people, I would very much recommend that they work in uh, one act, uh, the one-act play form and, and, and with actors and, and in theater before they get involved in, uh, in the movies. And a, a lot of directors don't have really the experience with working with actors that they might get if they start. Because started. what, they go to film school and then go directly to working in the movies and, yeah, and never hit a theater so, experience? so, even in film school, it's amazing. Really, all over the country, there could be a film department and a theater department and the students don't mix, they don't know each other. Uh, the Directing uh, students in the film department will never go and do one-act plays, which is the best thing a film director yeah. could do. To first work with the uh, performances and the content without the uh, burden or the the the, the uh, obligation of the camera, you know, and then having done some one-act plays and really have a sense of how you you help uh, an actor get to what you want, then go on and start to see what's the best way to put a camera to it. But how did you get from from? being influenced by Sergei Eisenstein to working for Roger Corman, who everybody knows is the king of the B-movies, yet at the same time has touched the lives of a lot of people. Well, I went to the UCLA Film School uh, in 1960, and, uh, um, you know, the first thing they told you at UCLA was, well, 10% of you are going to even stay in this program, much less... Become movie makers. Yeah, and it was very much uh, what we felt was, uh, you know, our wildest hopes were that we could maybe make an industrial film yeah. or, uh, you know, or, uh, or uh, whatever kind of film, a U.S. Uh, um, agency film or something, but the film, uh, feature film directors didn't seem, uh, you know, they were older and they didn't, uh, no one from a film school had ever directed a feature film, so, uh, y you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't as it is now where young people have the model of Steven Spielberg and they want to go in his footsteps it was it, it seemed like a closed uh, thing and and uh, of course I I having a lot of theater experience I was dying to work with a camera and uh, I was uh, very uh, and I and I was a writer which w and I was a writer who had put in a lot of years trying to be a writer whether I thought I had talent or not at least I I did it a lot and um, uh, there was an ad for um, uh, Roger Corman and we all knew that one thing about Roger is he made a lot of films and if you would work cheap you could work in films and be around a set and, and I hadn't even been on a movie set in my life. So uh, I remember that the day I was waiting for the callback of whether I could go in for the interview was also the day that the phone company was going to cut off my phone because I didn't have any money to pay the bill and I was just sitting there saying, please don't cut off the phone. Because I'll never get a job. Yeah, because, it, you know, and then sure enough I did get the, uh, the call and uh, they did cut off the phone about an hour later and I went, was interviewed, and, and, and I, I got this job, which was a funny job. Uh, Roger's uh, assistant interviewed me, and that led to a relationship where I sort of became his assistant 
because I would do everything. I would wash his car, I would move the sod of his lawn, I would rewrite scripts, I'd be the dialogue director on the Vincent yeah. Price movie, and I would edit all night. In fact, I even used to slump over the moviola and even be sure that when he came in at nine, there I was with my arm <laughs> over the moviola. And As he, you were taking care of him. Yeah, and he yeah. would see that I had you know, been there all night, which I had. Yeah. What led to the first film? Well, Roger, uh, Roger in his closet, had you know um, sort of these rolls of old film, uh, sh uh, you know, really even they weren't even uh, little trims. It was whole cans of films that he had left over, and there was a uh, there was a perfect tone recorder, which was a sort of movie sound recorder. And I mean, equipment to a young film student is you know is such a scarce and difficult thing to come by, especially in those days before video that um, uh, I heard that Roger was going to go to Europe and make a film called The Young Racers. And uh, he asked me, he said, Francis, well, you're at UCLA. Uh, do you know any young guy who could be a sound mixer? I said, I can. <laughs> and uh, I went home and I read the manual. And sure enough, Roger brought me to Europe as the sound man for a film he was making. And I, and I did that. And, and it was also second unit photographer shooting uh, the Grand Prix races. Uh, this is, a, I mean, a wonderful period for a guy 21 and uh, then miraculously just before we left I won the first prize in the Samuel Goldwyn Writing Award yeah. which had never been given to a, a, a film script so I had two thousand dollars which was the prize and I bought myself an Alfa Romeo sports car that's what they cost <laughs> yeah. and I mean Times have changed. I, I was 21 I was working on a movie around the set and uh, and uh, I knew that Roger always made a second film wherever he went because he would have the company pay for the first one. It was AIP. Mm -hmm. And uh, since everyone was there and the equipment was there, he'd always do one on his own yeah. to, you know, kind of average out the A moonlighting film. Yeah, but he had to go back to do The Raven, what a movie that became The Raven with um, a very f a wonderful film that he directed with uh, Vincent Price and uh, I think Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre really a, a nice little a little film and so I said to him let me make the second film and uh, stayed up all night and wrote a script and and and, and got Roger to give me twenty thousand dollars to go off to Ireland which was an English-speaking uh, uh, country so that I could uh, you know get actors and stuff and uh, and make my first film and that's how I did it did you remain close as you became famous and yeah, no, I, I, and had oh, your own studio? Yeah, well, Roger was uh, appeared inside uh, as in the cast of Godfather Two. He was on the Senate Investigating Committee. Yeah. Roger loves to act. And Roger told me once, he says, Francis, if you stay thin, keep your hair, and have a lot of money, you'll be young forever. <laughs> yeah. He, he's pretty... Harder uh, to do than to yeah, say. Most people say, well, I have two of those. <laughs> Talk about Apocalypse Now first, because I've got that here. And, and it is so central, it seems to me, to your life. I and mean, if you look at Godfather and then Apocalypse Now, look back on it and tell me what your hopes were and your expectations. I mean, your wife has made a documentary that a lot of people thought was an incredibly good documentary. Uh, Gene Siskel thought it was the best movie he'd seen that year. Uh, well, it, it was an extraordinary story in itself. Well, the origins of Apocalypse really, in a way, don't, don't begin with me. Uh, I had become, a, at a very young age, a uh, director of big studio feature film. Probably I was the first film student right. uh, to get that opportunity. And I was actually making feature films at, at Warner Brothers, and around me began to collect through an association with a, a young a USC student who was a kid and who uh, came, uh, one thing led to another and became a kind of assistant at first. And this is George Lucas. George Lucas, and I you know, recognized his um, intelligence and uh, know-how right away, and he became sort of my friend. I didn't have a friend, like a little bit like a younger brother. And so uh, or George, it turned out, I didn't even know this when I had met him, but George was uh, really an, an extraordinary USC student, uh, uh, had won every student award. He, he was really a heavyweight even in his own world there. And a lot of young people gathered around or were George's friends. And since George was now working uh, for me at that time and with me, they sort of would come in to get inside the studio. And, and our office was filled with people who later became the famous directors of that period. And they included? Well, uh, specifically John Melius, but right. it was John Melius. He was and, also a writer. Yeah. And, well, he was uh, a writer at Carol Ballard, uh, Caleb Deschanel, um, 
what's his name, um, Brian De Palma right. was around, and uh, of course, you know, it was like we we were the Trojan horse. We were in the studio, yeah. and we could get in through the gate, and uh, so they were around, and we were always talking. And the idea, uh, I think, even. Carol Ballard had always uh, been the one to say that he would like to do the classic Heart of Darkness, the Joseph Conrad novel, which, um, of course, Wells had wanted mm -hmm. to do and, and prepared but never made. And uh, also around was John Melius, who was beginning, you know, he's a great storyteller, Melius, and he was telling about these young guys, surfers who came back from Vietnam, and, and the vision of Vietnam was different than any war. I mean, it was guys on LSD looking at the, the rockets in the air and, and uh, of course the, the use of drugs as an element in that war and these extraordinary anecdotes that were coming back, guys surfing um, on, the, on the breaks in Vietnam. And this collection of uh, impressions and stories he had heard, he wanted to work up into a piece that originally I thought was called The Psychedelic Soldier. And the idea was that George was going to direct it and John was mm -hmm. going to write it. And Carol Ballard was in there also talking about Heart of Darkness and stuff. And at one point, not, not my idea, but at one point, Milius and George decided that they would somewhat borrow the idea of, of the boat going up the river to attach all these vignettes that John was uh, talking about to something uh, that he would write. And uh, I... I was interested in getting George the chance to direct a feature film, and in fact, I succeeded. And George made a film called THX right. 1138, which was his first film. And uh, the idea was that George would make as his second film a script that John would write. And I, at that time, I was able to wangle from Warner Brothers some funds to give all these young people money, so they could they could do it, including George. And uh, John Melius began to write a screenplay, which. Finally, he called Apocalypse Now, and it was um, uh, it was done, and it was a very uh, good script. We thought, and George was going to do it, and um, then we had a lot of you know setbacks, and the the administration at Warner Brothers sort of dumped us. I think they saw THX 1138, which was so far out in their minds that it wasn't what they thought they wanted to get into, and ultimately. Uh, all these scripts and stuff, um, because I had had the success with The Godfather, Warner Brothers made me buy back, which right. is sort of, I mean, that's outrageous. When have you ever heard of a studio head that when he leaves has to pay for all the <laughs> projects in a development? Yeah. Well, that's what they did to me. And uh, I ended up with all these scripts, and I went to George, and I said, well, George, let's do Apocalypse Now. And by that time, George was already going on and uh, doing other things, and I think he was even... I forget what he what he was doing. I don't know whether he was writing Star Wars, but he had already made graffiti. But at any rate, George couldn't do it. And then um, I went to John Melius, who 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 directed a fabulous picture. I thought his first picture, Dillin, Dill, uh, Dillinger. Dillinger, right? And uh, really, his be uh, one of his best pictures as a director. And I I certainly was impressed with John. And I said, Why don't you do Apocalypse now? It's they, his kind of movie to do. Yeah, and and he um, they wanted to do it, you know, in sixteen millimeter, and you know maybe uh, do it in much more in a newsreel style, which was George's concept. And um, I wanted to do something else. I was writing the conversation. I wanted to do the conversation. And the film later starring Gene. That late, years later, I got to do. Right. So uh, also another thing was happening is is my entrepreneurial spirit, which had been honed at Hofstra College. Uh, was was in action, and I realized that we could basically, we always wanted to be independent and control our own destiny with film and uh, against the idea of the big company that would kind of just use us and tell us what to do. So I developed with uh, some of my friends the idea that we would go around the world and we would make a film that we would finance by getting each country to put up a, an amount of money uh, as partners in advance, in other words, Italy yeah. would put up so much money, France, etc., and we would uh, get the money by getting distribution advances, and therefore we would own the picture. And I knew we could do this, but the question is, uh, you know, John Milius wasn't able to do Apocalypse, turned it down, or said, I can't do it. So it sort of fell to me, and I was the head of the company, and I, I believed that I could finance it this unique way, which I thought might be a precedent that we could maybe go on and continue to do that. And by doing that, we would be basically build a real company that really could make mm -hmm. movies and give new people chances and own the movies. 
So at one point, I decided, well, you know, I always liked the idea of this, uh, of the, of this idea, and I liked the script, and that I would do it myself. But I had different ideas about how to do it uh, than George and, and, and even John. Number one, I very much wanted to make it even more like Heart of Darkness, and in fact, if anything, uh, make it be a, a kind of transliteration of Heart of Darkness to the Vietnam setting, which was not really what they wanted to do. The end of the original Milieu script uh, was quite different. It didn't didn't really end in the same way as or without any of the kind of philosophy of Heart of Darkness, but rather ended in a in a giant battle in which uh, the Willard character joins with Kurtz and together they hold off the you know in a you know big yeah. John Wayne battle scene, and uh, that that didn't really feel right to me. Uh, but also, I didn't want to make it in sixteen millimeter. My idea was to do the opposite: to go there and make it in IMAX, yes, right? <laughs> you know, and to kind of make it in three D, make it in quadraphonic sound, to to kind of be able to go in and and uh, rather than a documentary, uh, to make it in in the opposite of that. And so, uh, what happened was I did uh, basically put up again my own money, which was in the form of my house that. By that time, I had come into possession. And this is after. I mean, the extraordinary thing about this is after the enormous success of Godfather. Right. Well, Godfather, and then really what was catching lightning in a bottle, Godfather and Godfather, Godfather Two, and the conversation. So right. I was in. I had won all these Oscars. Right. I had won five Oscars. You were the director of the decade. Right. And here I am. No one had ever touched the Vietnam subject. Uh, no one had ever made a film, a feature film, other than John Wayne, who had made the Green right. Berets. And I was going to take up all the money I had made, which I had, uh, among other things, bought the, the, the great Inglenook estate, which right. was the, the queen of the Napa Valley. And I put it all on the line to borrow the money, which along with the advances from all the European countries, I was going to go off to the Philippines and make this film. And but let me interrupt you. It, it, as we look at this now, I mean, before I even go to the clip and before I hear a lot more about this, was it the worst decision of your life? Oh, well, not at all. Not at all. I, don't, I, I wouldn't say that at all. I think it was, uh, I think it was a great decision. I mean, when else is it the time to go on an adventure when you're, uh, you know, kind of was what was I, 34 years old? Yeah. Uh, I don't think it was a bad decision at all. I but you mean you had all this going for you, and some have said that it marked something, that it was a turning point in your life, in your career, well, and that you rolled the dice. Yeah, but that was, and the you didn't. That was the thing to say. I mean, I, uh, as we know, very often the story is written before the story happens. And <laughs> yeah. all I had to do was to go off to the jungle in this condition and ask for a modicum of privacy, which is let me try to make this film. And already, as you know, the reports were coming back that, oh, it was a disaster, uh, primarily because no one knew. And it was just a mystery. Uh, and the story would to be that the guy who had made the Godfather and who, despite all odds, made a second Godfather that people thought was as good as the first and made the conversation, uh, was out there somehow failing because that would be more interesting than if I were out there succeeding. But it was a controversial project for all the reasons you just said. I mean, you didn't want to do it in the beginning. And then, you know, you, you, Harry Cartel was, hi was hired on. And then he was fired by you over whatever mm -hmm. differences or whatever no differences. It was uh, not at all. Harvey's a great actor. It was purely that as I saw the material, the kind of actor uh, Harvey is. Harvey's like a magnetic guy in that school of acting, which is, which is the focus is on Harvey. Right. And the character was a kind of witness who just was passive yeah. looking at this stuff. And I, that was basically, uh, in my mind, also Harvey was uncomfortable in the jungle. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just, you know, I had everything riding on it, and I just had to make a call uh, still admiring Harvey, you know, that there it's was not a question of Harvey, it's just yeah. a question of the kinds of things that happen to you yeah, in this but, film. But this is what a director does. A director makes decisions, and that's why you want uh, to have someone who's not afraid to make a decision, you know? And uh, I guess I felt that, number one, um, the fact, first of all, also, movies were at that time starting not just apocalypse, but we were to see the trend that movies were going to cost more money than a movie had cost in the past. It was in those days you could make the conversation cost uh, under two million dollars. Right. But no one had ever heard of a 20 or a 30 million dollar movie. I mean, Cleopatra was... What did The Godfather cost? The first Godfather cost six and a half million and the second Godfather cost 14 million. Mm. But that index was continuing to go, had nothing to do with Apocalypse, 
Apocalypse, being an ambitious production, was going to be another milestone on the index of cost. We, today, they talk in terms of films costing $80 million. This is a phenomenon of, of timing, and the cinema has nothing to do with... What's interesting about this, you think that, we, that we've come full circle and that the new wave of films are going to be small, interpersonal, about relationships, do you? I, 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 what I feel in a nutshell, to get off Apocalypse uh, no, Now, I'll come back to it, but is that we live in a world right now that, if anything, needs a cinema that sheds light on life and on the relationships right. of men and women and family and ideals, and, 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 but in a new form, a, a new content, whereas the film industry basically is such an important industry that it, by, by nature, must keep manufacturing a product because it has to have the people go back every day like you do at, at, a, at a fast food thing. So they're into, and the whole, and when I say the cinema, it's the whole hub of it, the criticism, the studios, everyone wants there just to be basically old content done well. And I feel suddenly, you know, there, there are all these young people writing scripts, hoping to be discovered to make their fortune. And I just feel that sooner or later some God knows, 19-year-old is going to write a script that's really about life and that is about, that is new because once again it's about something real. You fear that, you think that's going to happen. I would assume that there must be 50 scripts around about that. No, the young people, that. they're all writing scripts that's the next Sleepless in Seattle or the next film noir or no one writes a film about what they think about their, their, their brother. And but their, are they doing that in, I mean that's what Marty started doing too. I mean he went back and wrote a film, Mean Streets, right. was about just that, the but, kind of thing you're talking about, But that's about, right? why it was so welcome. I mean, yeah. even then, now all the more, as we live in an age where basically each year, whether it's a sequel or right. not, it's basically a recycled, and the name of the game, right. even the critical establishment doesn't want anything really new, because then they have to say whether it's good or bad. They would rather have something, this is always what happens in art, you know, the painters back then wanted a picture that looked yeah. like but a picture. But is the piano something new? I haven't seen the the piano yet because I've been sort of away. But, it, it, it but my my hunch that. is it's probably not. Probably not. Probably not new. I I, I don't know. Have it. you seen anything that that represents what you're talking about? That's really no. new. Nothing. No, no. I kind of took a year off yeah. from film, from seeing films, uh, from really everything. Just uh, since I'm 16 years old, this is the first year I took off, just to be able to look at everything with new eyes. And so you uh, don't you maybe spend a year not watching may, films, not right, not right. Not maybe Reservoir Dogs is new. I haven't yeah. seen that. My kids tell me it is. It is. Yeah. You know. So so. But that's what I think is going to be the next exciting. Uh, you know. Do you want to be part of that? Sure, to the extent that my weird personality and, and abilities can be part of that. I I feel I think all the time about about life and about no. uh, about the big picture of life, which is you know. Uh, spirituality and philosophy and politics and, 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 and what a new society could be like and how it could be beautiful, how we can retain the great traditions of the past, which is to say, you know, a right. book, yeah, right, and right, at the right, same right. time Especially. have one foot in the past and have yet one foot in the future and somehow, I mean, I, this is all I think about. Uh, what and, have you learned? I'm going to come back to Apocalypse and, and Godfather because everybody wants me to talk about that with you because it's so much a part of cinema history. But what have you learned in this year? What you have know? I learned? I mean, the, what have those fresh eyes seen? It, it, it's inappropriate me to try to give you a sentence. All right, I'm not know? looking for a summary, but yeah. I mean, just give me but some I, sense I, of I what... I basically feel that there are going to be some opportunities that happen um, that that uh, perhaps can give me what I'm looking for, which is once again the adventure. I think that once again um, there could be live cinema, there could be live television that is writer driven, that the whole uh, quality of writing and, and uh, the, th the thinking and content that is really the most essential part of the cinema could once again uh, get out of this outrageous kind of what they call developmental process and once again have authors who bring their views, which is their views of life and their views of, right. of people, to be at the center of then whatever the cinematic or television uh, uh, 
uh, product is and that ultimately perhaps live television. Tele think about it. Everyone's talking about television and and uh, the the incredible interconnectivity the interactivity of the, and the telephone, the, 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 the telephone, the, the cables. Of but yet, live television, which is a, which is an art form of its own, which we demonstrate in the United States in the 50s, right. which is which is writer, uh, which starts with the writer and which can go out live with live performance and in a way that is less. Uh, easy for the so-called corporate mind to control because when you go out live you're in the hands of the artist. Right. This to me is one of the most exciting new fields and I say yeah. new field knowing it's an old field where the whole world is going to be able yeah. to connect with some actors and some writers and some directors and yet you, you don't hear a peep about this you know in the world. But on the other hand think of this I mean we, we hear about what the well-worn uh, ideas of what's wrong with the world and the destruction of the rainforests and the extraordinary problems. Yet no one will ever even say what the real problem is, which is overpopulation. Uh, it's, the problem is not that they're destroying the rainforest. The problem is that the planet was not created to house more than four or five mm -hmm. billion people. So the, very often the things that are at the root and the most interesting is the thing that no one will talk about. So for me, live cinema or performance cinema could be uh, one of the new areas mm -hmm. to, to for a person like myself or, or anyone who's serious about really uh, interpreting life for the world, which is what art does. Let me test this on you, and, and I'm not a psychiatrist, <laughs> but he, uh, listening to you and having read a lot about you, I see this, and that's why I was interested in what had shaped you and how you came to get involved in movies. It's an interesting combination because I have talked to so many directors on this broadcast and most of them, most of them, on their short list of great directors is you. At the same time, there is this question in the public arena, whatever happened to Francis Ford Coppola? How did someone who did such sort of seminal films like The Godfather, why isn't he making great films? Steven Spielberg just made Schindler's List. He's continuing to grow, let's say. We wonder if you're continuing to grow, and we wonder if the reason is you had all, you were so driven by so many passions, family, entrepreneurship, building empires and institutions, that you didn't have a whole lot of time left for doing what you really did, which is make great movies. Well, my first response, my please? first response would be number one: my films were not greeted as great films when they came out. Even Godfather, which is the only film I ever made that had a what we will call a great success, was very controversial and critically uh, was really uh, at the time it was a mixed reaction critical hit. My films are unusual partly because uh, I look at art as an adventure and I, uh, I mean, what other film director, if you took his first film and his seventh film, are so dissimilar? My styles are always different. Uh, I'm very willing sure. to, to go in different directions. I don't just basically yeah. make the no. same kind of film. I hear you, and people can so, say. Yeah. So right from the beginning, in time, and I lived through it so I know, my work was always greeted even Godfather too. I mean, if you remember back, uh, the reviews and the and the buzz, uh, to use yeah. a contemporary word, was that Godfather two was not as good as Godfather one. Yeah. I know it because you know I was crushed because I knew that if that happened, uh, and, and I couldn't live up to the the promise of Godfather one, which at the time I spent my time uh, defending that I hadn't romanticized the mafia right. and that it had value as a piece of art. So that since in those days the films that I made, which are today considered classics, uh, were not considered classics, equally so the films that I've made more recently have the same reception. Yeah, but know? that does not mean that they were as good. But, but Just because they're now saying... Did I say whether they were good? I didn't say the first ones. All I'm saying is that the judgment of these films in their time was always that Francis Coppola is promising, but the reaction is mixed. And that's the same thing that they've said about films, just to pull one out of the hot, the Cotton Club. Right. But look at the Cotton Club, and then consider how it was received. And yourself, see what you think of the picture. Or, uh, you know, my theory is that when a film is unusual and tries to break new ground, 
that when that when uh, it, like a new food that you put yeah. in front of a person, I eat that. Mm, I don't yeah, like that because yeah, I have no m no. But six years later, ah, oh, that's I remember that stuff my mother used to make. Wow, I like that better than Hershey bars. So my only point is, first of all, it's not important whether a person is making great films or not, because as we know, what really makes a great film is one thing: whether it lives. Right. And that can only really be judged later on. So. For me, but but the, let me ask you, if, because it lives. Do you think, just you, mm -hmm. that the Cotton Club is going to live like The Godfather will live, or like Conversation, or even Apocalypse Now, which many people think was two thirds brilliant and right. Well, that, the, all my films were, were were considered that way. In my opinion, Cotton uh, Club is not in the same league, even close. When was the last time you saw it? It's been a while. Yeah, look at it again. The main thing is... Well, no, is no, but I'm, I'm interested in you, because I, I have not one-tenth of the ability to judge a film that you do. I'm saying, do you believe the Cotton Club is in the same league with The Godfather 1, Godfather 2? Forget Godfather 3 for a second. It's not for me to talk about my films as to what league, but I'll tell you this. Aside from the fact that many of the films I made post my studio were made more because I had to make a film and Bob Evans said I want to make right. the Cotton Club uh, go make it and I made one film after another basically on demand uh, I would say that the reason you make a film is a very important ingredient in what that film ultimately likes but to shock you I think that some of the films that I've made in this period, when you look at it in the long t term, right. will be reviewed on the same well, will be viewed on the same level as those earlier pictures. And I, that's what I'm interested in. Name yes. me those that you think might have that you think are every bit as good and that history will be kind to. Oh, I think Cotton Club for sure. One. I think Tucker for sure. Yeah, I agree. One. I think a film that's really out there and weird, and uh, people are just starting to understand that it doesn't work like a regular movie is Dracula. You know, when I made Godfather 2, as I said, the first thing, I remember going under my bed, on the floor, under my bed, because that's what a man does, because he can't just break out crying at the reaction to Godfather 2, with things that I you, overheard. You did what? I went under the bed, in the space between the bed, just to kind of hide, because I could We're talking hear, metaphor here, aren't we? No, we're talking <laughs> real space under the bed because there are very few things a man is supposedly allowed to do to express how he feels, but because I sat in a room after a screening and could hear people discussing the picture that didn't know I could hear it and heard the, the things they said about Godfather 2, which was... And you just I, wanted to go hide, get I, into the, under the bed. And in I, fact, you did get under I the bed. I did, because I felt secure under the bed. So uh, a, a, a filmmaker, you know, uh, basically put something out there on the table and the people judge it and usually with me I have never had a wild hit except for the first Godfather which was based on a wild hit of a book yeah that's right people were very it, critical they went to see it because they, they loved the book people were very critical of of that movie Marlon Brando mumbles uh, oh you, you but know, I mean, Alpa, they I, I, said that you but had that, to, that was a great you, except you, there was a great praise of his performance in Godfather sure, one. and as time went by the praise got greater and greater to me you know what can I say? I don't care. But I am saying that when you make unusual films, that you do not tend to get the praise in time that you get five or ten years later. And I can, I already hear people telling me things about movies that got that same mixed uh, reaction. You know, I saw that again. That was really, you know, that was, I can't get are, that are, movie But are you saying to me in your head, mm -hmm. you, that, that, that you have lived up to the expectation that you had for yourself? after the start that you got. I didn't live up to the expectation I had for myself with The Godfather or with, uh, the, yeah. with Apocalypse Now. Well, let now. me talk about Godfather for a second. I mean, we're, I'm, I, want, I love Apocalypse Now, and I want to talk more about that, but we're off to somewhere else now. I'm told that when you delivered a rough cut to Evans at Paramount, Godfather 1, it was scheduled for, for later distribution, that he, he said, Rob, Bob Evans said, I can't. I, this is not there. You go back and make a better movie. Is that okay. a true story? Now you'll get the, the real truth. Okay. I was editing Godfather in San Francisco. Paramount was in L.A. Bob Evans told me that when you bring me the film and show me the film, if it's over uh, an hour and 15 minutes, 
we're not even going to talk about it. The movie is getting brought to L.A., and you're not going to work in San Francisco. Just for the benefit of the audience, Bob Evans is at that time head of production right. for Paramount. I was told that if the picture was longer, because they did not want a long picture, if you want to retain your privacy and edit the movie in your own studio, which is partly why I'd done Godfather, was to keep being able to keep all these young film directors alive, and, and it was very important to me to be able to finish the film in San Francisco. I was told if I brought the film down to Paramount and it was over this length that it was going to be edited down in L.A. where they could supervise it. So we made the film. We made a cut of the film. It was like an hour and 45 minutes, and it was the movie. I mean, I have it on tape. Even right. in those days, I was <laughs> editing using yeah. tape. Yeah, you were, and you were we always said, into the what technology. are we going to do? We, we have a movie that's an hour and 45 minutes. Evan says if it's over an hour and 15 minutes, it's going to L.A. So for a week, we sat down, and we cut out this scene or half of this scene, and we brought a movie down that was, was, was an hour and 15 minutes. Right. Evans looked at it, and he says, you have destroyed the picture. You have taken all of the, 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 the texture, the family stuff out of right. it. He says, you're bringing it down to L.A., which translates into he was bringing that film down to L.A. where he could kind of be all over it, no matter whether I brought it down at 115 or 145. So then we brought it down to L.A. where we put back all the film that had been before we brought it down, and we made it up to uh, 145 minutes, and he looked at it and he says, See, now it works. Yeah. I mean, this is what it's like in Hollywood. I, yeah. you know, in and this way, is why you wanted to create your own studio. Of course. It was to be able to allow artists to have freedom from that kind of mentality. And yeah. you got it, but then you had to take all these risks, and you lost it, right? I didn't lose anything, really. I mean, uh, uh, do you have, you don't have the studio. Do I you? don't have the one in L.A., but yeah. I have the one in San Francisco. Yeah. I mean, do you have the freedom now and the resources to, I mean, to make the kind of movies you want to make? Well. That's tricky because the kinds of movies that I really want to make are not, cannot be easily classified by what was successful two years ago. So I really wonder if anyone other than Stephen, right. you know, uh, can make the kind of movies they want to make if those kind of movies are really new and that really break a lot of what the wisdom of the distribution business and the industry says. In other words, I don't think anybody can. Yeah, you haven't seen Schindler's, right? Not yet. No. Yeah. He said an interesting thing. He said, if I'd made Schindler's before, I don't think I would have wanted to make a dinosaur movie. You know. Look, I always felt that, that Stephen was a prodigy, and when people used to say that his subject matter was infantile or what have you, I said, hey, he's 45 years old. Every year he gets older, he's going to bring his talent to new yeah. subject and get his confidence. And, uh, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that he's made a, a distinguished film. He's made a lot of distinguished films. Yeah. Go back to you, Godfather. Uh, why? Tell me in your mind what it was about. Uh, everybody wants to talk about that, that it, the mafia is an American corporation. They want to talk about the family and all of that. What was in the director's mind? Okay, we'll change from what we were talking about, right. which was Apocalypse, right. that we kind of were I halfway exactly. there. But we'll go to The Godfather. To me, when I read, I the, have time when I read the book, The Godfather, it seemed to me that, and those of you who remember the book, there was this story of a family that seemed classical, almost, you know, kind of uh, like a Grecian or, or uh, of certainly of that or Shakespearean. And at the same time, there was this kind of Irving Wallace novel about a, a woman whose vagina was too big. I mean, half the book was dedicated to a doctor who made a woman's uh, genitalia smaller. People don't remember that now. But when I looked at the book, in fact, I didn't like the book at first because I thought it was sleazy. But this story of a, f of a man who was a king who had three sons, and uh, uh, each son represented an aspect of him, and there was going to be a question of succession. That is what I saw when I looked at the film, whether it was Joseph Kennedy and his right. children's or someone who lived. About a patriarch. Yeah. Is it, I know you hate this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Is it the film that you cherish the most? Uh, not at all. It's not? No. What is? You know, you asked me a lot about what I thought of my work, yeah. and I said more or less I really believe that my body of work is all about on the same level. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have never, yeah. I, my f flops, of which every director has, are probably sure. among the more interesting flops than people have. And did you learn from them? 
Sure, I always, I've, every film I make is an experiment in preparation for the next yeah. one. I never really did what it was I intended to do, which was to be really a writer of original material, original stories, original scripts, uh, because I can, that I direct. The only ones who've ever done that's Woody Allen, and to which I take my hat off. I, being a well-trained theater director and versed in musical comedy and, and uh, you know, the feeling that I could do a comedy, I could do Shakespeare, I could do anything, that worked against me because what I really wanted to do was to write original material for the cinema and then direct it. And I only did it on two occasions, The Conversation and The Rain People, much earlier. Yeah. And for that reason, uh, I haven't lived up to my expectations. And if I am to live up my expectations in this period of my life, uh, it would be because I do that. Yeah. And you're a young man. It's still time to do that. I mean, my sense of you also, and I don't want to impose my projection of you onto you, but it is that, you know, you wanted, you had a huge appetite. Yes, you'll give me that. And secondly, that huge appetite was directed towards creating, you know, a vehicle that could do the kinds of things without the interference. I'm a builder. That's exactly what I'm I would saying. like to build a city. If someone said to me, what do you want to do? I would say, I want to build a new city. I want to build a new society. I mean, I'm just a builder. So whatever I'm going to get to do shy of that uh, is going to be uh, what I do in these next years. <coughs> and, and, and your vision is to be some, is to, your, the vision you have is still to be the builder. It's what I am. I don't have, uh, you know, my vision we haven't really talked about, but but uh, you know, it's a, it's we're living in times that are, are 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 difficult to navigate through, both in a financial sense to be able to gain the confidence of those people who who control the financial existence of of our society, to to somehow position yourself correctly in the public perception, which means dealing with the press, which is which is tricky. As I my problems uh, that really when you talk about uh, what happened to me after Apocalypse Now happened with Apocalypse Now because of because when we began to be very very criticized and I began right. to be very criticized after I had done so much work. I couldn't believe that a, a, a young American who was willing to take all his money to go off and make yeah. a film about Vietnam should should basically not have some people who were like supporting him and I saying. Would, I, and I would agree with that too. Uh, so I mean, you were taking. I, you're, I you're was putting, blown away. You're by putting it. it all on the table. Yeah, and all I got was if you look at look at yeah. the stuff they wrote about it, you know, uh, basically I had done this amazing thing by making a what was to be considered a classic Academy Award winner and then without even wanting to ask to do it again and did it again right. and innovated the whole concept of a, one a part two and then after that it was time for my fall and if you ever ask me why everyone got down on me after Apocalypse Now which is another classic in some people's eyes I would answer it and say simply it was the thing to do. It was the nature of the way the world works. And it was if the, somebody it was goes up the slippery to totem pole, there's someone to try to reach and say, no, pull him down. It was my personality. I mean, they're going to do it to Oliver Stone because he has that. I mean, Oliver Stone is a you know, wonderful person, uh, like Milius. You know, these, a lot yeah, of times these guys yeah. who are you know, kind of tough and this and that, deep down they're the sweetest kind of most boyish kind of people. So you have to have the kind of personality that makes it attractive to do it. I would say that my problems began certainly in terms of my public image because it, it became the thing to do. But and are you saying also, I, I mean, is that all <laughs> it was to it? You accept no responsibility for any of the things that happened at, in the Philippines well, that, you that, take that you might not have been you, a little bit crazed over there? I wasn't crazed. I was making a film in which the concept was the same as really all my films are, which is to try to make a film that is as much as possible that is what it's about. Tucker, say, was the film was made like a contraption. Yeah. Tucker was, if you look at that film, it's like a crazy invention. It was about a contraption. Apocalypse Now was about a certain uh, madness when morality becomes so stretched that you're in an elemental state. And that's the kind of film I made and why Apocalypse to this day probably more captures the essence of that war than, than, than maybe other films do. Yeah. So that was part of the directorial style, which was also, it became very, those kinds of stories became very publicized and stressed. And the other 
practical, financial, logistical things that enabled us to get through that were not. All right, I'm out of time. You know, we do this autumn live to tape, as you know. Let's, this is an invitation to you. Half the stuff I needed to talk about we haven't talked about. Can I get you to come back? We'll try to work it out. Well, then I'm down. All right? Great to have you. Thank you. I don't know if I, and, and great to see that you're making great wine. Good wine. Okay. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola, it's a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We had clips to show. We had a lot of other things, but the conversation was too interesting. We thank you for joining us. See you next time. <laughs>